Welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's program is titled Engineering Design Challenge, Water Filtration, and is part of our NASA Explorer School Series. Our presenter is Rachel Power. My name is Connor O'Rourke, and I'll be moderating tonight's program. Jeff Lehman is online with us to provide any technical support. Web seminars are just one type of resource that you can find at the NSTA Learning Center, your online portal for professional learning and over 10,200 resources for science educators. You'll find that over 3,500 of those resources are free and you can add them to your library to access when it's convenient for you. We encourage you to join the conversation in the community forums where you can discuss content and classroom issues with other teachers. Our online advisors are available to help you find the information you're looking for. And you can use our free tools to help organize your own professional development to meet your goals. It's all available at learningcenter.nsta.org. Now I would like to introduce tonight's presenter. Rachel Power is the coordinator at NASA Explorer Schools and Digital Learning Network at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Also joining us is Marty Phillips. Uh, she is shadowing Rachel tonight. Uh, she is a jet. Uh, she works at the NASA Explorer Schools Education Specialist uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So, without further ado, I will give it uh, to tonight's presenter, Rachel. Thank you very much for uh, having us. Thanks, Connor, and uh, thanks, Jeff at NSTA for helping to put on tonight's web seminar. I want to also thank all the participants today for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight. Um, as Connor said, my name is Rachel Power and I work for NASA Explorer Schools. I'm located at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And my background is uh, teaching high school mathematics and physics um, for about nine years before coming out to Kennedy Space Center. I've been working here for about four years with both the NASA Explorer Schools project as well as NASA's Digital Learning Network. We're going to be focusing today on just one of many different resources that NASA Explorer Schools has to offer. It's called the Engineering Design Challenge Water Filtration. It's intended for grades 9 through 10, Earth and Space Science or Physical Science, but I'm sure many of you will be able to adapt it for your particular classrooms. So I uh, encourage you to use discussion, use your, your chat windows to talk about um, ideas and ways that you might be able to modify it. And if you have any questions, um, Feel free to type them at any time in the chat window. I'll try to keep up with the discussions as they go. And I will also pause at different times and give you the opportunity to ask those questions in case I miss them during the chat. Um, I really love to have engaged participants. So without further ado, let's get started. I know Marty is here today. She's somewhere down in the, in the chat window or down in the participant window. So thanks, Marty, also for being here. I appreciate you, uh, your participation as well. So my first question for each of you is just to kind of get a feel for how many of you are already NASA Explorer Schools members. If you are a member of NES, go ahead and give me a green check. If you are not a member of NES, a red X, please. Uh, to anyone who came late, uh, you can select the green uh, check or red X by the fourth button to the right on the toolbar in the participant window right underneath your name. Before we uh, tested that out and it had the A, B, C, D, E options, but uh, now it's been changed so you can respond uh, accordingly. Thanks, Connor. I'll actually be using the green check and red X quite often, so it's a handy button to find. So it looks like roughly um, Half of you are already NES members, which is great, so welcome back. And if not, maybe uh, something you see today might inspire you to go ahead and join. It's a great program, and um, one of the things that's really nice about it is we provide you with lots of resources. So, for example, this is the, uh, the guide, the NASA Engineering Design Challenge Water Filtration Guide. Um, it's a 42-page guide, so very extensive, lots of details about the lesson. But one of the things that NASA Explorer Schools has to offer, which I hope to help convey today in this webinar and to provide some value to you, is that it gives you a comprehensive package of resources to supplement this lesson. 
So I'm going to share with you many of those resources today along with a lot of background information that you'll hopefully be able to use and show your students how the things they're learning in the classroom today, they're relevant in the real world and this is what NASA is doing in order to solve real problems and this hopefully will help get your students engaged and really involved in STEM. So if you pick up this guide and start to flip through it, you'll find all kinds of background information, tips and tricks for the teacher, like um, not just the materials that you're going to need, but a basic cost estimate so you can get a feel for what it's going to cost you to, uh, to do this lesson in your classes. There's reproducible worksheets, because any NASA resource, um, education resource, is copyright free, so you can download it and print it and copy it as much as you want. And there are a lot of great resources for the teacher in terms of diagrams and glossaries that you can use to help educate your students about some of the, uh, the new information they'll be learning relevant to NASA. So the guide itself is a great resource, but again, at NASA Explore Schools, we want to make it even easier for you as a teacher because I mean, we know it's hard work, so we want to make this project friendly for you. So we put all of these resources together along with video segments, professional development, um, slides and scripts right in one website and uh, that's, you can find that through the virtual campus. So my goal today is to make this PD professional development relevant to you and immediately useful so you can go right back to your classroom and try to implement this lesson. And, uh, and hopefully you'll find there's lots of other good tools and resources on the virtual campus too for free access to any teacher grades 4 through 12. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. So as we go through the web seminar today, my goal is to kind of give you a brief overview of the lesson, kind of help you come up with some ideas if you were making your lesson plan, well, like what kind of uh, standards are you going to address, what's the main topics. But then I really want to spend a large amount of time helping you better understand the background information so that you can tell the story to your students of why is this relevant and how does it relate to NASA and what problems are we trying to solve with this technology. And then we'll get into the lesson itself and how you're going to be able to help guide and direct your students through this inquiry-based activity. And finally, I hope we'll have some time together to discuss some extension activities or ideas that you might come up with as we talk about the lesson today for how you could maybe modify it for your class or take it further and make this project your own. So these are all really important ideas. I mean, I really encourage group interaction or social learning. So we'll be using the chat tool quite often. Um, and hopefully with the help of Connor, I won't miss any of the questions. But again, I, I will try to pause throughout to, uh, to make sure that I don't um, go over any questions before we move on. So without further ado, let me uh, take a moment before we get into making the plan and, and really looking at this to see if you have any questions about NASA Explore Schools or, uh, or in general, the, uh, the guide before we get started. If you are good to go, give me a green check also to see if you're paying attention. All right, I see lots of green checks, so we're moving on. And in this lesson, um, the, the students are going to be basically building a water filtration device. That's kind of the, the, the main crux of it. So there's, there's all kinds of different ways you can go about doing it. We have some presentation slides you could use to engage them. But I'm going to start with a video for you guys. We have lots of little engaging videos on the virtual campus. And these classroom videos might be things that you could use as an anticipatory set to kind of get the students motivated before you get into all that background information and start telling the story, just something visual. So this video I'm going to show you is really just a, a short 30-second overview, a little music video we put together that kind of shows you little bits and pieces or clips of what the activity kind of looks like in a classroom, sort of thrown in with some of the NASA content and uh, just a quick video segment. So this 30 second video is going to load up on your computer, hopefully, and it should automatically open a browser. If it doesn't, just give it a moment. Um, I will also post the link in the chat window so that you can try clicking that if you are unable to have it load. 
Um, and if all else fails, copy and paste it, save it for later um, when you have maybe a, a, a better connection or, or more bandwidth. So I'll give you guys about a minute to view this video. All right, so I'm starting to see some green checks coming in. There's, a, without doubt, always going to be some technical issues. Not everybody is able to see it. Um, but certainly, if you, uh, if you got a, a message that you need to install QuickTime, then at least you know what the problem is and you can view it later. If you were able to hear it but not see it, my, thought, my, thi my thinking is that uh, a window probably popped up, maybe is hidden behind some other uh, windows on your computer. So it, it's probably there somewhere. You just have to search, dig around, find the window that has the video in it. It should be some type of a web browser, whether it's Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, whatever is your default browser. Um, and again, it was very short, so that's why I gave you guys just a minute to see it. Some of you might just take longer if your bandwidth is, is, uh, is slow or, or limited. So. Be prepared. There's going to be some of those frustrations with the webinar. I apologize in advance for those, but I'll, I have a couple other videos I'll be showing. And again, I'll try to give you time in order to view them. And I'll always post a link in case you're having difficulty. All right, so continuing on, the guide itself. Basically, the challenge is designed around the students building a water filtration device. Um, it is inquiry-based, which means that essentially they're going through a process of designing and testing their, their filtration device. They don't have any set directions. They get to kind of explore on their own. The guide itself is kind of interesting. It says it's recommended for grades 5 through 8. But um, when we kind of looked really at the content and where it fit best with the standards, we really found it fit more with the earth and space science and physical science for you know y the lower high school grades, grades 9 through 12, or 9 through 10, sorry. So depending on your students and your grade level, you may be able to adapt it um, down to middle school or even up to some of the higher level um, high school science classes like chemistry. So keep that in mind that, again, there's a recommended grade range, but there's always some possibility for modification. The, the recommended three to four 45-minute classes, this can, uh, again, be modified depending on how many iterations of the engineering design process you want to do. I mean, this can take up to five class periods. You could even extend it to, to possibly seven. But I would say a minimum probably of three 45-minute classes in order for the students to, to truly design their water filtration device, build and test them, and then have some time to discuss and, and uh, maybe even make modifications. But the, the more time you give them, the more op opportunity that they, they have to actually retest, redesign, and learn from their, um, their designs. It's also a great lesson in order to look at um, some of the things in your community, your neighborhood, in terms of engineering and wastewater management. I know a lot of teachers, after they do this lesson, or maybe even before they do this lesson, they take the students on a field trip to, uh, to their wastewater treatment plant and provide some opportunity for them to see what happens in the real world in their own communities. And then they are going to go back in the classroom and design their own uh, filtration device to, to filter wastewater. The engineering design process is throughout because they are coming up with a design, they're testing it, they're collecting data, and then they're going back and redesigning. So this is uh, kind of the basic overview of what the activity or lesson is all about. If you haven't had an opportunity yet to look at this activity or this guide, I'm going to go ahead and put the PDF or the link to the PDF in the chat window. So um, you're welcome to download it. But again, it's also available on the NASA Explorer Schools virtual campus along with many, many other resources. And I'm sure NSTA will also post it um, in their resources for this particular webinar. So there are plenty of places to find it. So the, the standards as listed in the guide, of course, are older standards because they haven't been updated. 
Um, as we start to look at the next generation science standards, of course, we're now in the second draft phase of those standards, so we're kind of adapting as we go. But essentially, the things that we're looking at in terms of uh, what the students will what the standards will be addressing with this activity, what the students will be learning. Um, they'll be looking at ways to develop, manage, and use resources that are beneficial or sometimes cost effective to society. So this relates to the human sustainability standard. The engineering design is all basically kind of part of the process because they're going to be taking data of how their filtration device um, how effective it is, and they'll be implementing solutions to try to improve the effectiveness of their filtration device. It also relates to chemical reactions because they will be using some different filtration media and looking at how that impacts the water. They'll be testing conductivity as well as pH. And throughout the process, they're using, they're looking at how technology and engineering impact society. Um, there's like a lot of global challenges today when it comes to water supplies and clean water, um, the need for clean water. So anytime you're addressing these things through engineering, you're, you're focusing on this last topic, which is how uh, engineering, technology, science, and society kind of all interact. So this is kind of where we're going. Of course, this may be adapted a little bit more as the next gen science standards are finalized. So with that, I'll pause again, take a moment to see if you have any questions before we go in to the background information for you know, why this problem is so important and how you can uh, relay that to your students. If you have no questions, again, green check. All right, I see no comments being typed. So. I think this is my favorite part of the lesson is really trying to hook your students and coming up with a way to do that. So I've really gotten interested in the whole concept of making really any lesson a story um, because people are interested in stories. So if you tell a story, you, you get somebody's attention. And so I was thinking about this activity, this lesson, and how we can make this problem a story. And it's really quite simple because this, this is, in fact, a real world problem. So I'm going to give you some of that basis for where this problem comes from. And, uh, and then we'll look into what are some ways that NASA is looking to solve that problem. And then this will lead into what your students will be doing in the classroom to try to solve the problem. So it starts with just water in general. Now, of course, we know water is important. It's essential for life. It's one of those things that whenever we search, you know, in our solar system, when we're looking at other planets, it's one of those things we're always looking for. Is there evidence of water? Did water ever exist, liquid water ever exist on another planet like Mars? Um, because we know that water is such an essential factor in life, uh, we, we hope that if we're able to find some evidence of water, that sometime in the future we might be able to find evidence of life somewhere else. So just looking at our Earth, roughly 75% of Earth's surface is water. I've seen that estimate as low as 70, but in general, about three quarters of it. So when you look at the Earth from space, that's one of the first things you notice about our planet is the water. I mean, and it's in many different forms. We have the liquid form, the frozen form. Um, you can do that experiment with your students where you have them catch a globe and you look at how many times their right thumb lands on water versus on land and you, you can then do the probability of the, the statistics to determine what percentage of the Earth's surface is in fact water. So the, the importance of it or how vital it is, I don't think that's in question. Everybody knows that water is very important. But the question is why is it so uh, so rare, so so difficult to have this clean water for everybody on the planet when there's so much of it available. When, when you look at the surface, that's what it appears to be. So perhaps your students aren't aware that there's a problem, that you know, 2 in 10 people on, the, on this planet don't have a clean water source. Um, but if they're not aware, this, I think, next slide helps put some perspective on the, uh, the water issue. So this is a really cool image because you're looking at the amount of water 
available in terms of volume. So, of course, when you look at it spread out over the surface, it looks like a very large amount of the Earth is, in fact, water. But when you look at it in terms of volume, the comparison makes it look very small in relation to the, the volume of our Earth. So the amount of water on the planet is, in fact, small. If you think about the ocean, is really just a thin film of water on the surface. So there's three spheres here, blue spheres. The, the largest one represents all of Earth's water. So any liquid fresh water, water in lakes and rivers, basically all of it. And it looks small, but you have to consider, because it's three dimensions, it would actually have a volume of about um, 332 million cubic miles. So its diameter is roughly 860 miles. So this, this represents basically all water, if you could take it from the ice caps, the lakes, the rivers, groundwater, atmospheric water, even the water in you and me and your pets and plants, everything combined, that's all the water that exists on Earth. So now we go down to this smaller dot. This represents, out of all of that water, the amount of liquid fresh water. So when we look at liquid fresh water, we're looking at groundwater, lakes, swamps, rivers. Um, and that sphere, just to give you some relationship to the other one, is at roughly um, 170 miles in diameter. So the volume would be about two and a half million cubic miles. So finally, we get down to this little itty bitty speck which is right about over Atlanta, Georgia there. So that little tiny bubble represents the fresh water in just the lakes and the rivers on the planet. And basically, the amount of water that most people um, use for everyday needs in terms of the surface water. So this little tiny sphere is uh, about 22,000 cubic miles in volume. And its diameter is only about 35 miles. So yes, if you were to compare that little speck to, say, some of the Great Lakes here, you'd think well, that speck looks tiny compared to a Great Lake that can't possibly be all of the fresh water, surface water on Earth, because the Great Lakes are bigger than that speck. But then when you look in terms of its diameter, it's, uh, the diameter of one of the Great Lakes is only like roughly 300 feet, whereas the diameter of this, this uh, little speck here is actually 35 miles. So you get a, a concept of it's much bigger than, uh, than what it appears to be because you don't have any depth perspective. So this comes from the uh, USGS. They had a great description of this, this whole page. I thought it was a great way to kind of give some perspective as to the water and what's available um, on our Earth. It's also available in a uh, graphic form here, we can see these different um, charts, bar graphs to, to represent the same thing that you were seeing previously in, in the in the visual with the um, with the spheres. So here, this first bar represents the total amount of water available, and you can see up here in blue um, of that total water, how much of it is fresh water. And then the fresh water is broken down further, so you can see how much of that fresh water is available in terms of groundwater versus in glaciers and ice caps versus uh, surface water. So then you break down the surface water and uh, other fresh water even, even further, and you can see how much of it, of that surface water is available in terms of lakes and rivers and uh, and swamps versus ice and snow. So the amount of that actual water that's available and ready to use is very small compared to the amount of water that is, in fact, on our Earth. So again, this comes from uh, USGS, um, a, a great resource in terms of uh, finding a lot of information about water availability 
and where it comes from. I can post a link for you guys. I'll put it in the chat window in case you're interested in taking these to use. And uh, here is a link. So that looks that gives you the uh, global water by volume. And this next one is uh, the chart with the uh, distribution of Earth's water that we're looking at right here. So with all that in mind, let's look at our usage of water. So I would love to hear what you guys think about how many gallons of water on average do you think Americans use in a day? You can type your guesses in the chat window, or maybe you can guess as your students might. What do you think your students would, would say? Of course, they don't have very good concept often of volume. <laughs> and then it's interesting to talk about what do we mean by use. I mean, is it, are we just talking about drinking or every, uh, every single gallon that's consumed? Now, estimates vary drastically that I've found online. There's uh, a wide range of different estimates. So the one I'm going to use comes from um, a website called, uh, what is it? It's WaterSense. This is from the EPA. And Donna, I think you were looking at it in terms of a family, because I think I saw that estimate somewhere, too. 400 gallons, but if you break it down to uh, an individual, um, it was estimated to be about 80 gallons. But I think this was an overestimate by the EPA because this was their water sense page, and I think they were trying to make a point. But um, that uh, that came from some data about the the amount of water that comes it goes through a family household and estimating how many people were per house. But essentially, if you look at how much Get how many gallons of water an average family uses in a day. They're looking at approximately, well, each person uses most of their water in terms of toilet flushing and showering and things like brushing teeth. Um, the amount you actually consume is very small compared to the amount that, uh, that you're using in a day. So 80 gallons represents everything from washing clothes to uh, brushing teeth to taking a shower. So here is a, a breakdown, a little bit more detailed in terms of where, where does that 80 gallons go. And again, the chart clearly shows you how washing clothes and flushing the toilet and just running the faucet and shower are the most significant uses of uh, your water in a given day. The toilet alone is just kind of surprising. 20% of our water usage just comes from the toilet. Of course, now there are some better water sense toilets available that you know you can do your half flush and things like that. So yes, thank you, Monica, for posting the water sense link. I was going to do that also. Um, they said older toilets usually use three and a half to seven gallons of water per flush, but the uh, the newer water sense toilets um, require 75 to 80 percent less water. So there's lots of different things you can do in order to improve the efficiency of in your in your own household. And you can talk about that with your students as well. You know, ideas for what what might they do in order to reduce some of the water usage. Um, do you guys have any other ideas? What what are some other things that you your students can do on a daily basis that you might be able to conserve some of the water usage? All right, so yes, definitely looking at your um, washing machines and looking for a higher efficiency washing machine because some of the, uh, again, based on the WaterSense website, traditional models use 27, between 27 and 54 gallons per load, but new energy and water conserving models use less than 27 gallons. The low flow toilets, definitely. Um, even some simple things like uh, keeping 
a pitcher of water they suggested in the refrigerator because otherwise you sometimes will run the tap water for a long time to get cold water, but if you have it in the refrigerator, it's already cold. Although many of us use filtered water now anyway, right from our refrigerator. Um, making sure your toilets aren't leaking, no leaky pipes, those sorts of things definitely saves water. Turning the water off just while you're brushing your teeth, excellent, another great idea. So all of these are things that you can talk about with your students and kind of get them involved in terms of water conservation, the stuff that they can do every day. So now let's take this concept of water and the need to conserve and bring it into space because that's just kind of interesting, the fact that, well, if you're living in space, you don't have access to the water that we have here on Earth. You can't just run the faucet. So what do they do? Well, in the early days, Mercury and Gemini, during those missions, all the water that, they, that the astronauts were going to consume had to be taken up with them. They used it, and then any wastewater was just discarded. So there was absolutely no recycling of water or any of those products. When we got to the Apollo missions, so this is the uh, going to the moon, those missions, they, uh, they did use fuel cells on the Saturn V rockets, and those fuel cells, which were used to produce electricity, produced water as a byproduct. So there was some water produced through that process that they were able to use. But essentially, it's still um, all the wastewater was discarded and that they did have to take up a significant amount of water for their consumption. Space shuttle um, also used, the orbiter also used fuel cells to produce electricity. Uh, again, by combining hydrogen and oxygen, so again, water was a byproduct of that. So through the space shuttle program, again, the, uh, the ability to bring less water was um, available because of the fuel cells, but the astronauts really weren't able to spend a significant amount of time on board the space shuttle because they didn't have the uh, technology to really recycle and reuse. So on the International Space Station, where now we have astronauts, three to six astronauts at a time can live and work for uh, six months or more, and this is essentially the space station the size of a football field, if you imagine from one end to the other, an uh, entire football field. and it's living quarters and it's the laboratories where they work in the middle here, it's roughly the size of about a five bedroom house. So imagine how much water a crew of six astronauts on board the International Space Station would require. So this is where NASA had to start thinking about how to um, conserve water, recycle water, because it's just not cost effective in order to bring all that water to space with them. So that's sort of what the mission of the uh, Environmental Control and Life Support System team, this is what their goal is, to try to essentially make life for the astronauts as easy as possible and to provide the resources that here on Earth is natural for us. I mean, Mother Nature provides the air we breathe. Um, the water we drink, a lot of it is just recycled through, uh, through nat nature's natural processes. So on, on Space Station, we are basically looking at how to develop technologies that are um, able to do these same things, but also reduce the, ex the cost, because um, everything we bring up with us, the total mass costs money to, to, uh, to launch into space. It takes up space, and so that's volume inside of our space station. Um, it takes power to run the system. So we're constantly looking for ways to develop more reliable, more capable, more efficient systems to allow our astronauts to live for a longer and longer periods of time in space. So on average, an, a crew of six astronauts on the space station would require approximately 6,800 liters of water in a year. So this is uh, sig actually significantly less than we would have here on Earth because um, they limit the astronauts to 11 liters a day, roughly. So that's as much water as they can consume is about 11 liters per day. So that's not a lot of water, but 
things like the environmental control and life support system helps to reduce the amount of water that they have to take up in, in a given year by a, a large amount, and that saves a lot of money. In fact, does anybody have any idea how much it costs to launch, say, a pound of anything into space? Yeah, I like that, Rita. It is interesting for students to realize that no water is really <laughs> clean, pure water. I mean, everything has been recycled. We're constantly reusing water. All right, I see quite a range from 1,000 up to 400,000. And Rita has gone to space camp. So my next slide is slightly incorrect because it has the wrong units. Um, I'm not sure where this unit came from, but it is supposed to be per pound. So yes, it is roughly $10,000 per pound. Although this figure is also debatable. I've seen um, some different statements online depending. Some sites do say 10,000 per kilogram based off of the Delta IV rocket, using that as the, uh, the cost basis. But so roughly $10,000 per um, pound or kilogram, depending on what source you see. So with this in mind, I'd be interested to see if you guys want to, you don't have to share with me, but uh, calculate how much would it cost to launch yourself into space if it costs $10,000 per pound. And then, if you want to think about it even further, think about how much water you use for you know, a year or six months or whatever, and th take that in consideration as well. So it's, it's very costly to put things into orbit. I mean, just thinking about that one crew member drinking 11, or not drinking, but consuming 11 liters of water per day for six months. It's an interesting math problem to figure out how much it would cost to uh, keep that person in space. Just uh, for one simple one liter bottle of water, you know, we take that for granted here on Earth, but it would be, you know, roughly $22,000 to take one liter of water into space. And to think that it costs, uh, it's 6,800 6, liters, we said, per um, crew of six for a year, so that would be almost $150 million to, uh, to supply them that water for a year. Um, so somebody asked about the conversion. One kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. And of course we know one liter is equal to uh, one kilogram. If we were to go back to, um, to to gallons as well, if you're looking at how many gallons you consume in a day versus liters, uh, you can convert one gallon is about a little more than uh, three and three quarter liters. So lots of opportunities from converging converting here with your students, talk about different units as well. So just kind of, that's kind of interesting background to see why it's so important because of the cost in terms of space. Um, I'm going to pause here before we get into the solution, what can we do to fix this problem, and to see if you have any questions. I saw a lot of stuff going through the chat window, but I couldn't keep up with all of it. If you have no questions, again, green check. Thank you to uh, Valerie, he was quick on the draw there. All right, so it looks like I didn't miss any questions during all that interaction. Thank you guys very much for participating. I love the uh, participation. Stay engaged, this is good. All right, so let's look at how different systems basically recycle water. And we'll start with nature. 
So this is a good opportunity to review the water cycle with your students or to introduce it if it's new to them. But essentially, looking at the natural method for water purification, because some of those methods are really what NASA refers back to in order to uh, come up with their, their own environmental control and life support system. Because Mother Nature really does it best. So we're just trying to basically replicate what nature is already doing. So it's important to understand how nature, what systems nature uses, you know, besides just, you know, evaporation and uh, precipitation, like the whole process of the water going down through the rocks and the soil and the sand and how that filters out many of the contaminants to provide, you know, clean groundwater and essentially how that groundwater eventually makes its way back to the uh, streams or oceans and things. So all of these things are key to helping students develop their own concept for creating a filtration device. So the water cycle is just kind of a natural way to start the process, talk about how this happens naturally. And go, to go back to, I think it was Rita who said it earlier, uh, maybe it wasn't, but somebody mentioned that um, they like their students to understand that all the water they're drinking has been recycled. So essentially, you could be drinking water that um, came from, who knows, back in ancient times, somebody else might have drank that water and uh, essentially you are drinking it again. So it's just gone through a whole process to clean, to be cleansed. So this is a good time to, to get into that. So how do we do that here on a daily basis? Well, well, that gets back to what your cities are doing locally in order to treat water, to make it, to, to clean it. So here's another little, um, uh, site you can use from the EPA that talks about water treatment. There's lots of these out there and again you can go to your local water treatment plant and uh, they usually have some sort of outreach. You can bring your students there, take a tour. I remember it was very eye-opening for my students to get to go out to the water treatment plant and tr truly understand the process um, of how water is cleaned and it makes them appreciate water more when they know uh, what all goes into to cleaning human wastewater. So you can go through this process with them. We have um, some videos on the virtual campus that you can look at that discuss both the water cycle and the water treatment process, um, just real briefly. But there are a lot of other resources online that can go through the process and describe each step of the water treatment process. And then you can have your students relate it back to, to the natural water cycle and see what steps are similar and what are different. And uh, what do we do, what does a uh, human do to clean water versus um, Mother Nature? And then there are some places, this is kind of an interesting term from toilet to tap, but there are some places in the world where people are actually taking wastewater and turning it into drinking water. Um, I, just to give you some, a little bit of background on this, you can read up more about this, but uh, in Singapore in 2003, they opened up the first um, recycled drinking water uh, plant called New Water for their little area because they don't have a lot of access to groundwater. I mean, Singapore is very small. So essentially, they were able to take water um, and Make, and pass it through a process where they did a significant amount of tests. I mean, the World Health Organization basically even condoned their, their standards that their water was clean enough to use for bottled drinking water. And it, basically, they're expecting that this process will be used to produce about 2.5% of their daily uh, water consumption in Singapore each year. So they're growing it, but basically using some sort of advanced membrane and microfiltration um, techniques along with reverse osmosis and using ultraviolet disinfection. So that's just one place. But even going back further, South Africa, um, the country of Namibia, they've been using recycled drinking water since 1969. And they basically have no evidence of any negative health impacts based on the consumption of this recycled water. Now, what's, what's funny is that, well, not funny, I guess, but 
interesting is that in 2001, Los Angeles, uh, which is a very water-stressed area, I'm sure as Marty can attest to, they uh, they tried to pass the same thing, but the public basically was like, no way. They they didn't like the idea um, of drinking recycled water, and that's where this term from toilet to tap came from. These were the people who were against um, this process in Los Angeles, and so they actually voted down uh, the the attempts to come up with some water recycling project for that particular area. So we are trying to get uh, more adept at trying to fully recycle water here on Earth, but there's still a lot of people who are just opposed to it because of the idea of it. But again, the more we can get into our students' minds that they're drinking recycled water anyway, it's just going through a process of nature as opposed to um, a man-made process. So this is NASA's answer. This is uh, part of the Environmental Control and Life Support System that's on board the International Space Station. And you're looking at two racks here. They're like a, roughly, imagine like a uh, refrigerator size rack. And these provide not just the water that they're going to be using, but it also can be used for providing oxygen and removing carbon dioxide from the air. But this is where the water recycling system on the ISS comes from. So it provides water from drinking, food prep, hygiene, all of that. It even monitors temperature and humidity levels in the space station. It helps to circulate the air through the modules and takes out some of the particulates and the microorganisms from the air to get clean air. So that's the, the purpose behind the, uh, the water recycling system and, and all of ECLIS. But really, it goes through quite a process to recycle that water. Um, it takes every bit of wastewater, whether it's from the urine of the crew members, um, wastewater from hand washing, from brushing their teeth. It removes the humidity from the air. Um, any waste that comes from their spacewalking, all of this is collected in the in the WRS, the water recycling system, and it completely cleans it to be consumable water again. It's basically been able to reduce the amount of water that needs to be launched each year by about 6,000 pounds. So imagine again, 6,000 pounds times $10,000, you're saving a lot of money by creating this system. It uses a process in which first, like let's say for example, just the urine processor unit or assembly. It, it uses the, the low pressure of the vacuum of space to be able to basically recover water from the urine and basically make, uh, have some of it evaporate, whereas the solids, um, they, uh, they, they settle out to get this evaporated, this gas, basically, of water vapor. And then you can condense that back into a, a pure water. And many of the processes that we use here on Earth that you require gravity, they're able to use rotation in order to separate out some of those things that we would have here. We would use gravity to separate them out. Um, in addition, there's different filters to take out some of the solid material like hair and lint. Um, there are some different uh, processes in which they're able to remove some of the, uh, the gases like you can see here remove some of the carbon dioxide and produce oxygen for breathing. So this is all part of a system that is used to monitor and control the life support for the crew on board the International Space Station. So coming back down to Earth, what does this do for us? You know, what are we going to do in order to help um, the two out of ten people that don't have access to clean water here on Earth? And it's interesting, there are already some spin-offs from the NASA technology. There is a, um, a carbon nanomesh filter called Water Stick, you can see that here, that was designed for NASA, but is also now used um, and operated to help clean water. It cleans about five gallons of water per minute using uh, water pressure about 3 PSI in gravity. There's no need for electricity 
heat, um, no chemical additives like iodine or chlorine are needed, and it's able to save a lot of money, you can see. Uh, it doesn't, it's very cost effective. There's a program called Engineers Without Borders, which many different um, NASA folks, there's a, I know a group out at Johnson who, are, who participate and they go out to different countries where they have uh, very little access to clean water. And they first, they really work with the people there first to see you know, what their needs are and what they can do because every place is different. But they've uh, built systems that can treat up to 50,000 liters of water a day to provide water for about 3,000 people. And it costs less than one-fifth of a cent per liter, so about one cent per gallon, um, to help provide them with clean water using many of the same technologies that are used um, on board the space station. So this is really what your students are going to be doing in the challenge. Their mission is to design a water filtration device that will provide the purest water possible. And they're going to try to do it much the same way that, uh, that Mother Nature does in terms of filtering water through different types of um, media and coming up with different ways to test and determine if that water is as pure as possible. Looking at the amount of material they use, perhaps the order that they place it in, but that essentially is the mission and it all comes down to a real life problem that students are going to uh, be solving just like NASA is trying to solve right now for the space station. Now I'm, I'm going to get into more detail of the lesson, but I wanted to pause here and see if you have any questions on some of that background information, really the story that leads up to the actual challenge. So again, green check. You're good to go. I'm going to try to browse through the chat window real quick here. I saw some questions coming in. So the, how adaptable is this system for home use? I'm assuming you're talking about um, the ECLIS or the Environmental Control and Life Support System. It really was designed for the space station. So in and of itself, it's, it's not specifically designed to be used in a home environment because of some of the technology is specific to space and the environment of space. But um, there are components of it, like I said, that have already been turned into spin-offs that are used here on Earth. And, uh, and some of those I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a, I can give you guys a link to another site, a spin-off page that talks a little bit more about some of the technology that's used here on Earth. Let me. All right, I'm going to put that in the chat window. Carlos asked, where does the nitrogen come from? I imagine the nitrogen is a byproduct of our human waste. But I'm not sure I have to look back at the slide and see. I think you were referring to this slide. So yeah, I believe that the nitrogen that is um, mentioned here, it comes from the uh, wastewater and, uh, and that's filtered out. We'll talk a little bit more, Kate, about the filtration media in just a moment. So I'm going to wait on that question. And Robert asked about how the vacuum is used to purify water. So again, I'm not um, an expert on the, uh, the ECLIS system in itself and all the, the steps, but from what I understand, um, when you lower, essentially I know this, when you lower pressure, we know that it lowers the boiling point of water. So essentially if you took wastewater and put it in a vacuum, you would be able to cause the water to boil, essentially turn into a gas or a vapor. And so you would be um, separating the water from some of the other waste that's in the wastewater through that process of boiling. 
uh, and then eventually you would take the vapor and condense it back into a liquid and you would have a more purified water because the waste in that waste water would be left behind during the boiling process. All right, continuing on. So the next step is to look at the challenge itself, and we're going to look a little bit more detail in terms of what steps you're going to be going through with your students and uh, some of the different materials and things that you're going to need. And looking at the questions again coming in. Is, this, is space vacuum used? I would imagine so. That would be, I don't know for sure. That would be a, a question I would have to look up. But it would seem like that would be the best resource available rather than trying to create a vacuum. You have the vacuum of space available. And uh, some of the wastewater, by the way, not all of it is recycled. Some of it can be uh, vented overboard. And it's kind of funny the <laughs> astronauts, at least especially on the space shuttle, when they vented the, uh, the wastewater over. And I know at least Mr. Bob Cabana, he's our center director at Kennedy. And when he talks to students, he will share little things about his, his uh, experiences in space. And so he was a four-time shuttle astronaut, twice as a pilot, twice as a commander. And one of the things that he shared once with a group of students that I thought was very interesting is when the human waste water was vented overboard, he would look out the window and he says it instantly crystallizes, turns into these beautiful ice crystals. He says it's one of the most beautiful things he's ever seen, even though it's uh, human waste that's going overboard. But kind of an interesting <laughs> thought to, to imagine these astronauts and they're looking out the, the window, the hatch, whatever, and they see this, these beautiful ice crystals, which is human wastewater. All right, continuing on. So materials. In terms of the type of filter media that they're going to be using, th these are just a few of the different possibilities that you see on this slide. Um, essentially, you could provide your students with a really uh, whatever, it can make it open-ended, really, in terms of what media they could use. Um, the guide recommends anything from um, plastic wrap, cotton balls, coffee filters, activated carbon, um, aquarium gravel, sand, uncooked popcorn. These are some of the different types of materials. So if you look in the guide, there is an extensive list of different materials that could be used. Now, each group, you're going to have to um, split them into teams. And so each group is going to need to have two water bottles, essentially, to build their, um, their whole device, their water filtration device in. Some cheesecloth for the bottom of the bottle to hold the media in so that the water can drip through it but keep uh, all your sand and gravel and everything inside. Um, you're going to need some just basic materials in terms of keeping things clean and keeping the water available. So like uh, balance scales to, to measure the mass of the, the media they're using. Buckets and sinks would be great to dispose of some of the water as they're using it. Um, graduated cylinders for measuring. They will need some instruments for uh, testing pH and conductivity. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then of course you're going to have to develop the wastewater, which requires some vinegar and food coloring, some hair and lint and sand and stuff. Uh, some cups, just plastic cups and towels would also be um, helpful. So that's kind of like the basic overview of what you're going to need in terms of materials. But again, you can be pretty inventive with coming up with ideas. And they don't have to use every single material you provide. It's just put it out there as an inquiry lesson. Let them think about it and try to come up with what's going to best help uh, filter their, their, their water. Um, the guide does, in fact, talk about some of the elements and how they 
um, filter the, the media or how the media filters the water. And we'll talk a, a little bit about some of those in a moment. So throughout this engineering design process, the students are going to be really thinking about their design. It's important that the students spend time in the design phase and don't rush into testing it. Uh, it's really good for them to be able to think about what media they're going to use, and what order they're going to put their media, why are they going to use that, why do they think they should put it in that order. All of these things will help them really think through the process um, and help them determine really what is most effective and why it's most effective. So I'm going to show you another video. I told you guys earlier that I have a couple videos. This one, I love it because it's in the classroom. It's students in the actual design process. So I wanted you to take a look at it so you get a feel for what this activity looks like with your students. So I'm going to, again, try to open it up in a browser for you, but I'll also post it in the chat window. And I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to watch this video. All right, so it looks like about half of you were successful in viewing the video. Again, I know there's always technology issues. I just wanted to apologize again if you were unable, but hopefully you're able to copy that link and view it sometime in the future. Um, again, it's also available on the virtual campus as another place to go and uh, take a look. Possibly you'll be able to view it from there. And on the virtual campus is also downloadable, so you can put it on your computer, and uh, that way you don't have to worry about whether you have a slow internet connection or anything like that when you're in the classroom and you're wanting to uh, to use the video. So one of the things I noticed while we were watching the video, I scrolled back up, and uh, somebody mentioned something about using gluten-free products in case your students are tasting the uh, the clean water. Now note. <laughs> I would not recommend, Kate, I'm sorry, I would not recommend that I actually taste the water during any part of this process. So they will be um, testing it in terms of the, uh, the pH and the conductivity, but I would not recommend that it's safe for drinking um, because they're not necessarily going to be able to test all the different types of impurities that could be in the water, especially if you really follow the directions for making the simulated wastewater. You're like sweeping up like dead skin cells and dust and things from the floor. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. So the source is a wastewater that you are creating, James, and the, the guide gives you kind of a recipe for it. Um, involves vinegar, salt, uh, like truly hair and dust and things from the ground that you sweep up and some food coloring just to, again, add some, of the, some other color and impurity to the water. Um, so they're not going to be able to, to truly clean it to a stain for drinking, most likely based on their filters. Um, and they're not using things like iodine or anything like that to, to help eliminate some of those microorganisms. So n definitely not safe for drinking. Um, I don't know what the EPA standard for safe drinking water is and how we can test that. That would be something I would have to, uh, to do some research on. All right, continuing on. So, I think somebody also asked about the iterative process. So the idea is in this activity, they're supposed to design and build a filtration device, test it, and when they're done, they're going to actually create a brand new design and, and uh, base it off of the, their first test and what they, the results they get. They can uh, try to improve on it and see if they can get, come up with a better design. Um, 
they can do this multiple times. The guide also suggests that perhaps you create a group, a class filtration device based off of feedback from all of the different groups. They can report back on what aspects of their design they thought were good and what, what weren't and how successful they were and then using that to design a filtration device for the class. And they said instead of making it a competitive process, to treat the whole class as uh, a big team where you have different groups working on the same problem, trying to come together to solve it. So that's where the, uh, the iterations come from. So essentially, the, uh, the students um, will be taking their water bottle, cutting off the bottom, layering their filter media, and then essentially testing their design. One of the tips that I like in the guide is they suggest making sure that if you want to reuse any of the filter media, to stack coffee filters in between so you can easily take them out and move them and reuse them. It's easier to separate it that way because um, it's obviously very difficult to separate sand from you know, gravel and other stuff unless you have them already separated by coffee filters. And you definitely will want to do that with the activated carbon because that's something that's fairly expensive and you will want to reuse it. Um, the activated carbon has to be uh, dry in order to be used. So once um, the team uses that particular amount of activated carbon, you want to set that aside, rinse it off thoroughly with, with clean water, and then leave it out um, to dry on either paper towels or newspaper or something. And also, if you rinse it prior to using it, uh, you'll get a lot of the kind of like black color out of it so that it's a little bit cleaner and, and the water comes out a little more um, clear than not so gray or, or uh, chalky looking from the activated carbon. They will be testing two aspects of the water, pH and conductivity. Um, you can use either you know, litmus paper or if you have a commercial pH meter, you can use that as well. There are definitely probes and things out there available. Uh, same thing with the conductivity meter. There's commercial conductivity meters and probes you can use. You, there's uh, directions in the guide using a multimeter and batteries to develop your own. There's also conductivity meters you can find online. They're very simple. that simply uh, use a light bulb to light up. Um, so that's another possibility depending on uh, what kind of funds you have available and resources and materials you have in your classroom. So these are different ideas for for the, uh, the two instruments that they're using to test their, their water. One of the other recommendations is with the litmus paper to, rather than dipping it into the water like you see here, that does contaminate the water. So they recommend taking some drops of water out of your sample and dropping it onto the litmus paper. It's one additional way to kind of keep your water clean and clear and uncontaminated. It's very, very important that the students pour the wastewater through the filter slowly. That's one of the things I wanted to emphasize. Um, so that, for one, uh, the water can saturate through all the different filter media and truly um, basically don't oversaturate any particular area of, like, let's say, for example, on the activated carbon, because then it's not as effective. You also don't want to pour all of your, your wastewater in the same spot. You want to kind of pour it around and cover all the, the area within your uh, filter device. Um, if they shake or squeeze their filter media, they're forcing the water through faster. So we recommend, again, that just let it flow naturally through the media. Yeah, and it would be OK to let them test that. I mean, that's part of the inquiry process. You don't have to feed them everything. But again, I want to kind of give you some of those tips and tricks. So that way, uh, you have some ideas on how, how to help guide them. But yes, definitely, any time they can uh, learn from their own failure, or uh, from other people's successes, however it works, that's always a good thing. Um, in terms of uh, other couple of tips and tricks, I already mentioned that you, in order to reuse the activated carbon, you need to let that dry. So that's um, important. In terms of 
your students and how many times you want to go through this retest and redesign. That's really up to you and how much time you have. But uh, the guide recommends at least letting them create two different designs and then coming back as a group, allowing the students to report back and, uh, and then conclude with a poster session in order to describe you know, what their filter system was and how effective it was. On the, in the guide itself, it goes through each of the different media and describes um, in a little more detail how they can be useful in filtering the, uh, the different wastewater aspects. It's on page 21 in the guide, but just to kind of give you a quick overview, the activated carbon is used for removing the organic contaminants um, and helps with the taste, the odor, the color, that sort of thing. The sand and the gravel, thinking back to kind of how Mother Nature works, it's our natural filter media and it helps get rid of many of the uh, particulates. It's kind of like a mechanical or physical filtration device. Believe it or not, macaroni or pasta, even the cotton, does serve some purpose because they do help to trap some of the particulates. And because they absorb water, they will also help absorb some of the salt that you put in there into the, uh, into the wastewater. And it will also help to um, absorb some of the food coloring, which will help the water come out a little bit more clear. So they do, in fact, even though they might not seem like they serve a purpose, they do have some purpose in helping to, uh, to clean the water to some degree. Now, I know we're just about out of time, so I'm going to just real quick skip ahead to the extension activities. Um, and some of the suggested modifications or extensions that are in the guide, I apologize that we don't have time for you guys to share your ideas, but uh, hopefully you can go ahead and do that in the chat window while I'm talking through some of the examples. And uh, if you have any ideas of your own, definitely share them. But uh, again, teachers in the past have brought students to their local wastewater treatment facility as an extension activity. Some teachers have decided to test their own water from different sources. They've looked at uh, rivers in there or streams in their particular area. Um, some teachers have brought in different filter media completely. Like here, you're looking at some unpopped popcorn. Um, maybe even looking at some commercial filtration devices and, uh, and looking at what kind of filter media are used in each of those. Um, because we're, this is related to space, you could set your own limits in terms of weight for their filtration device. You can even provide a cost breakdown for their media per, um, per volume or per mass unit so that they have a, a cost limitation as well. Um, and then you can look at more, depending on your students and their level, you can look at some more uh, sophisticated water treatment processes like desalination and what all is involved in that. There is one other activity out there, although the competition is no longer active, it's over, but this was a middle school challenge that came out a couple years ago called the Waste Limitation Management and Recycling Design Challenge. It's a mouthful, it's called Wilmer for short. But uh, one of the cool things is they have a guide that's out there um, and a video that was used to introduce the guide um, that was filmed on board the ISS by an astronaut. And so it, it provides some additional resources for the teacher that might help you with uh, planning this lesson. So I'm going to put those links in the chat window as well in just a moment. But I wanted to uh, conclude there. Say thank you very much for attending tonight. I know Connor has some things he wants to share with you as well before we sign out today. You guys are very welcome. And again, Connor, I'm turning it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that. I had a bad connection for a second. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, tonight's uh, presenters, uh, Rachel Power 
And uh, thank you to uh, Marty Phipps, who was able to chat today. Uh, and I would also like to thank NASA for sponsoring tonight's uh, web seminar. Uh, and uh, thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support of web seminars. Here's a look at our web calendar. Uh, coming up, we have engineering practices in the next generation science standards on January 15th, human body space adaptations, January 16th, the periodic table and bonding, introducing a free online resource for middle school chemistry on January, uh, January 17th. You can register for upcoming programs by visiting learningcenter.nsta.org slash web seminars. We look forward to seeing you again on another NSTA web seminar. Thank you, everyone, for your participation.